Okay, um, time to start the final session. So I can just have your attention, please. So the final session is about evidence and how do we use evidence to promote change. And we want to look at how um, we, we, we embrace the role of evidence in actually informing policy. So this is evidence and research uh, for a purpose. And how do we get messages from the research community through to policymakers in defining what works and indeed what doesn't work or what don't we know, whether it works or not. And um, in order to um, uh, get us into this, we're going to be drawing quite heavily on the Work Package 6 uh, um, programme that was led by the Dutch National Institute of Health, uh, RIVM. Um, and at this point, I was hoping to be able to hand over to Kate Pickett, the Professor of Epidemiology at the University of York, but unfortunately um, she's ill. And so we wish Kate uh, all the best in terms of recovery, and um, I am going to continue to moderate uh, through this session. Uh, and I'm joined uh, by uh, four panellists, and I'm going to introduce each of them to you now. So we've got uh, Barbara Kirsteins, who's Head of Public Health for DG Research and Innovation. And I think it's worth noting, and it shows the Commission's uh, commitment, that this is the fourth separate directorate from the Commission that has contributed to the uh, conference today, which I think is really impressive, actually. Uh, and then uh, we've got Noel Cotter, who's the Public Health Development Officer for the Institute of Public Health in Ireland. Uh, we've got Meryl Schering, uh, researcher for Erasmus University uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the home of Erasmus, obviously, the home of Professor John Mackenbach, uh, who's the leading academic in health inequalities. And Angela uh, Donkin, uh, who's uh, both a member of the scientific re reference group and also a senior advisor uh, at the, uh, the University College London Marmot uh, Institute uh, in London. Uh, so uh, we're going to have three uh, presentations, uh, short presentations, and then I'm going to get um, uh, Angela to uh, respond. Um, so with no further ado, over to Barbara. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to put uh, maybe this topic of research a bit in context, uh, I was very pleased uh, this afternoon to hear such an explicit commitment from different ministers and Secretary of State to the issue of health inequalities, because it is really one of the important values uh, that was made explicit in the treaty, uh, aiming to eliminate inequalities and to promote equality. And then I think it's important in this whole debate to highlight also the common values and principles agreed in the EU that sees equity as one of the overarching issues. However, as you have heard throughout today, people with lower education, lower occupational class or lower income tend to die younger age and to have a higher prevalence of most types of health problems. So health inequalities in Europe are still there, they persist, and we need to do some more, something more about it. Now, what can research do? Well, research in general should help to inform policy and action. And in today's context, this means policy and action in the field of health promotion and disease prevention, as well as health systems and services organization and management. Now, collaborative research funded by the Union allows to tap into the richness of Europe's diversity and to tap into the richness of the different ongoing, what some people call, natural experiments, taking new approaches, new actions, and uh, demonstrating that they work, so that member states and everyone can learn from one another. The Commission has been financing research on health inequalities, and you will hear more about that, and you've heard already about that. Uh, and we've invested under the seventh framework program more than 30 million euro in this. But addressing issues of the social determinants of health and health inequalities within <coughs> Europe, but also beyond. I think in addition to specifically tackling the issues of health inequality and uh, demonstrating a defect for example, one of the elements is the importance of the life course approach 
to prevent inequalities, further inequalities to rise. The research has also demonstrated some good examples of policies that work. And we have all a series of research that is currently still ongoing, uh, documenting uh, in a very explicit way uh, what kind of policies work and which kind of policies work less well in uh, reducing inequalities. Now, beyond the research that focuses explicitly on health inequalities, we have to bear into mind that uh, other types of research that address the issues, for example, of health systems and health services organization as well, may also be a factor uh, contributing to addressing the issue of inequality. And, uh, for example, the research that uh, analyzes the issues related to health workforce, mobility and planning might contribute to improving access to care to everyone and therefore help reduce inequalities. Now, another uh, dimension would be uh, the research funded uh, under the heading of personalizing medicine. If uh, we, this type of research is well designed, it might well demonstrate that we can reach in a better, more efficient way specific groups of people, specific groups of patients, and therefore also uh, contribute to uh, reducing inequalities. Now, as is mentioned in Sir Mohammed's report, further research and knowledge building on effective policies and interventions is necessary. Policy monitoring, evaluation, implementation research, and impact analysis are crucial next steps. And in this context, uh, in the context also of Europe 2020, in dialogue with member states, Horizon 2020, the future research program, or the just started uh, research program, makes it very explicit that it will support research on uh, health inequalities and um, social determinants of health. And this uh, program will be rolled out in the coming years, and we believe it's very important in dialogue with you all here, uh, whether it's industry, whether it's member states, whether it's uh, uh, civil society, to outline some of the important uh, gaps that you would want to see addressed. One of the points uh, is that there is a need for more action-oriented <coughs> research, more support for health system transformation, providing the data to help uh, those countries that would like to undertake some reform, and various speakers before alluded to this, have the data to uh, help them decide on what, which is the best way to do, conduct this reform. But when we talk about health systems transformation and address organizational <coughs> issues, it's important to keep the equity dimension in mind. So, for example, under the first call that has been put out now for 2040, so call for proposals for research, we explicitly ask researchers that uh, would design a research proposal to develop and implement a new model of healthcare to demonstrate that that model not only provides uh, safe and quality care, but also doesn't have a detrimental effect on equi equality, equity issues, or rather even a positive effect. I will stop here, but I think one other important element is that we are funding, not only we, but also the member states, a large body of evidence that needs to be tapped into to inform decision making. And that is really one of the other big challenges. And I welcome your views on what could be best done about this and how we can engage in a fruitful dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. And now turning to uh, Noelle uh, from uh, the Institute of Public Health in Ireland. Thanks, John. Good afternoon. The Institute of Public Health in Ireland were delighted to be an equity action partner 
and to have the opportunity to contribute to several of the work streams, um, including Work Package 4, where we undertook a health impact assessment of a proposed tax on sugar sweetened drinks um, that Mark Drakeford, um, Drakeford uh, referenced this morning, um, which is available, if anybody's interested, on our website, which is publichealth.ie. For Work Package 6, we undertook a literature review of interventions with parents in the early years for improved health outcomes focusing on behaviour and cognitive development or school readiness. The Marmot Review stated that the foundations for virtually every aspect of human development are laid down in early childhood. The early years have a lifelong effect on many aspects of health and well-being, from obesity, heart disease and mental health, to educational achievement and economic status. But not every child has the same opportunities. The UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence identified the risk factors for conduct and oppositional defiance disorders as being mainly the same factors that are associated with social exclusion and health inequality. However, resilience factors amongst uh, persistently poor children include parenting. Uh, parents, as a catch-all term for primary caregivers, are among the biggest influences on children's outcomes and the Institute of Health Equity describe parents as critical to a child's experiences in the early years and their life chances. 62 journal articles met the inclusion criteria for our literature review. These included systematic and evidence reviews and evaluations of multifunctional and specific interventions. I'll give you a brief overview of the, the key findings of the review and highlight interventions that were recurring in the literature search that have been rigorously evaluated. I also hope to give a bit of a sense of where more evidence is needed. Overall, published research indicates that, in general, parenting interventions work. The research evidence reviewed largely demonstrated positive short- to medium-term outcomes and advocated for proportionate universalism. In other words, that each family should receive a minimum dose of core components with targeted supports for families with additional needs. Providing a universal service can also help to ensure the reach of a programme and destigmatise it. More people can be reached through a universal service who would not otherwise be identified, whilst providing a service to everyone makes it more palatable. Delivering parenting interventions as part of a wider package or programme of supports can aid in destigmatising involvement, as well as also providing a more holistic approach and being more cost effective. Positive impacts on parental mental health was a consistent finding across intervention evaluations, which have potentially positive repercussions for other children and uh, relationships within that household. So there are these knock-on effects. In terms of delivery models, the effect size was greatest for interventions that included both the parent and the child, rather than the parent only. And mixed site delivery, that's delivery of an intervention in the home as well as at a centre. Some cost-effective interventions were identified that had positive results by providing what were in effect distance learning opportunities for parents um, where they could use CDs or DVDs or interactive feedback tools in their homes. But the strength underpinning parenting interventions across the literature and research reviewed was for providing a high quality service. Quality services were provided through an evidence-based structured curriculum delivered by well-trained staff with opportunities for practice and feedback. Two parenting interventions in particular recurred throughout the literature search, the Triple P and the Incredible Years programmes. The designers of the Triple P programme describe it as a public health approach to parenting. It was designed as a comprehensive population level system of parenting and family support with differing levels of intensity and narrowing population reach appropriate to need. The Webster Stratton Incredible Years programme was developed to reduce conduct problems in young children and also to help improve parental competence. It's been uh, widely rolled out in various countries. A randomised controlled trial of Incredible Years in Ireland, one of the first within a European context, focused on a high-risk sample recruited from real-world urban settings that demonstrated a significant improvement in outcomes following a parenting intervention uh, delivered by community-based staff. Although overall parenting interventions reviewed appear to have positive outcomes, this must be tempered with a few uh, notes of caution. The follow-up for these evaluations was principally short to medium term, and self-reporting was often a feature of evaluations. So we can't say conclusively that all positive outcomes were independently verified, that they are sustained across the life course, 
And causality can also be very difficult to attribute um, to one particular intervention, in, in this case, uh, parenting interventions. In the medium term, refresher interventions may be needed throughout the childhood uh, to reinforce those interventions in the early years. And uh, we also need um, longer term uh, outcomes to be evaluated. Real world rolling out of parenting interventions beyond the trial may reveal more modest results due to scaling up, problems of fidelity, gaps in skill sets and comorbidity of conditions. But the evidence remains that quality parenting interventions in the early years can be effective in promoting health equity and if there are long term benefits across the life course, the costs are modest in comparison to programs that might be required later in life. And if I may end on one final note of caution, parenting interventions are not an inoculation. To be effective, they must sit within a context of wider family supports and interventions to address inequality and social exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, for that excellent uh, case study. Um, now turning to uh, Meryl Shearing uh, from Erasmus University. Thank you. I will present the main results of the review, flexibility of the labour market and health inequalities. There is ample evidence that labour force participation is an important determinant of health inequalities. Non-employed persons are twice as likely to die and the prevalence of depression, anxiety and somatic illness is higher among non-employed persons compared to employed persons. However, health inequalities may also exist among, among employed persons across different types of employment. A, sig a significant percentage of the European workforce is currently working under temporary employment contracts. The aim of this review was to investigate whether there are health inequalities between temporary and permanent workers. And with temporary workers, I mean all workers who have a non-permanent employment contract. For example, fixed term em employment contracts, uh, on call uh, or um, seasonal workers. The results showed that temporary employees more often had mental health problems and injuries compared to permanent workers. In addition, temporary employees were more likely to die compared to permanent workers. The results of the review indicated that workers with a low socioeconomic status were particularly vulnerable for the adverse health effects of temporary employment. In addition, variation between European countries in the association between temporary employment and health was found. Health inequalities were smaller in Scandinavian countries than in Southern Europe countries. It seems that high level of income security and a low employment protection in the Nordic countries is more protective for health inequalities than the low level of income security and higher employment protection in the Southern countries. The following policy measures may be protective for health inequalities among employed persons in a flexible labor market. A relatively loose employment protection in combination with adequate income support to facilitate labor market mobility. And a focus on lifelong learning to ensure, ensure employability of workers. And an active labor market policy to ease the transition to new jobs. However, there are some questions that still need an answer and more research is needed to investigate which specific subgroups are particularly vulnerable to the adverse health effects of temporary employment. For example, older workers, workers with a low socioeconomic status and workers with a chronic disease. Another question which needs to be further investigated is which labor market policies contribute to less health inequalities and a higher labor force participation across European countries. And the third question that needs to be addressed is what are best practices in EU member states that support inclusion of persons with chronic diseases in the labor market?
Thank you for your attention. Another excellent, uh, succinct uh, case study presentation. Thank you for that. Um, now, um, in order to get the uh, juices flowing and get our discussion uh, started, I'm going to ask, ask Angela Donkin just give her reflections on uh, what she's heard and also on the uh, work package six more, more generally. Okay. Um, well, I will keep this short. It's the end of the day and I'm before Michael, so um, I'm sure everybody um, would be grateful for that. Um, I've been privileged to be on the scientific advisory panel for the knowledge work stream and the two last speakers presented two very good examples of some of the research that was done for that work stream. Um, we did have fact sheets outside um, which summarised some of the research with policy uh, makers in mind. Um, I've heard that they've run out, that's great. Um, but just to let you know, there will be um, some more fact sheets on the website. There will be up to seven, I believe, um, uh, coming out shortly. So what I'm going to do is just share some thoughts on what I've heard with regards to research and some of the things that have been said today. Um, but the, the idea is really to get um, you know, your ideas from the discussion. Um, one of the things that was said earlier today by uh, Peggy Maguire was that actually we don't need any more research, we need to act. Um, and then we do need to act, and I kind of think I know where she's coming from, but I can't possibly let you go today uh, thinking that we don't need any more research. Um, um, and Barbara has, uh, and, and others have uh, throughout the day mentioned research gaps and policy gaps that need to be filled. But generally it is reassuring. I mean, the questions aren't about making the case anymore. The question is about, okay, let's, let's have some help. What, what works? Um, some of the evidence presented by Michael earlier on with regards to the life chances of people with poor education across member states illustrate really well that, you know, we can do something right now. For anybody who hasn't sorted it out, good social protection systems must be um, surely an important first pillar of response. So we can do something now with the evidence that we've got and the research that we've got. And we can do more. Um, we know, for instance, about housing conditions, employment conditions. We know a lot of detail about uh, what's good for health. Um, we, we need to avoid damp homes. We need to avoid cold homes. We need to avoid overcrowding. There's lots of things that we know. Um, and we know that action across those will further flatten the gradient. So we do know enough to do something, to do more. And really where we're at now is, well it should be, to help policymakers choose how to do things better. What are the best interventions? What are the best systems? And I think the two research examples presented here to get today um, give some good pointers as to the future need for research. The parenting paper, which by the way is very helpful, somebody's asked me about what parenting programs work, so I'll go and, and, and utilise that very heavily, um, is, is a very good example of work to identify uh, interventions that will help. However, there's a lack of long-term evaluation of interventions. Now, if policy makers want us to be giving them uh, examples of what works in the long term, then back to policy makers and government, we need um, long-term evaluation of interventions. And researchers need to get involved, I believe, in the design and evaluation of in interventions and make sure that health equity measures are included in those evaluations because if we don't look at the effect on health inequality, we won't really know how effective they've been. Uh, the paper on the effects of temporary employment, I think, also highlights the need for ongoing research. The world changes, employment conditions change, and we need to be uh, current, uh, with current advice on, on what's happening in the labour market, for instance, or in other aspects of the social, um, social policy, and be able to, to respond, uh, respond to those. Um, uh, Barbara has already mentioned the need to monitor progress um, and so forth. So, um, 
as I said, I, I didn't want to, to talk too long. We want to hear about your research priorities as well. But before I finish, I would like to mention the role of research to inform the initiation of action. Um, I did say we know enough to do something and to do more, but it isn't always being done. So what more can the research community do to shed light on incentives and barriers to action on health inequalities among officials, among political leaders, among business leaders, and so on? Um, how can researchers better work with experts in the communications field, for instance, to get our message across and create um, a burning platform for action. Okay, so they're just some of uh, the thoughts that I've got about moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Now, it's over to you. We've got um, just over 10 minutes, so straight away I can see a hand up. So, uh, would you like to ask your question? Hello, my name is Catherine Hartman. I represent AEMH here. We, um, AEMH um, are doctors. Um, my question is for the whole panel is about the pace of findings and research. My point is the pace of research doesn't match the pace of uh, political uh, elections and yet the policymakers and the, uh, the people who are leading countries need to make decisions uh, sometimes without having the evidence, without having the research because action needs to be done. So my question is how, how do we judge on, on policies that have been implemented without enough evidence uh, but just because necessity made it, a, made it a, a, a absolutely a, a impossible to, vo to wait for evidence with, with what is going to come next. Maybe the next evidence is going to say, well, this, this policy action actually doesn't work. We implemented, we invested in millions in it because such and such needed to uh, be active or be re-elected because that can be a reason. Thank you. How do, how do you address this? Thank you. Really good question. Um, just take one or two more and then I'll um, open it up. So yes, this uh, just here in the middle and uh, at the back, we'll take four actually and we'll take one there as well. Hello there, my name is Nicolien Thompson from the Netherlands, uh, actually from the institute that um, coordinated this, this work package. I was, I was wondering, and my question really is uh, to Ms. Kestians, um, if whether um, the new research program, Horizon 2020, um, might be supporting anything in the area of maybe joint program in initiatives on health inequalities because this was a joint action was from the uh, funded through the health program and I know that the um, the research program has some very interesting instruments other than just projects so I was wondering if you want to do some more, more work with with member states and um, looking at what works and maybe would that be an interesting instrument to use for that. And now uh, the gentleman, yes. I am uh, David Murray, uh, Public Health and Economics uh, Consultant with Matrix, which is an economics consultancy from London. Um, bringing together this section on research needs and, the, uh, and Sir Marmot's comments uh, earlier, um, I think we can't neglect the economics research needs in, in this arena. And in, by that, I mean in the very broadest um, economic sense. For instance, in the UK, with the recent move um, of public health responsibilities to local government, um, I'd like to see some research commissioned um, or analysis, perhaps, on the economic cases um, at different levels of economies, whether that be national or local, to try and make stronger economic arguments for investment um, in the uh, improvement of health inequalities. And I think even though this is a justice issue, it's, it, it's naive to think that uh, we won't be required to make economic arguments, and that's, that's an appropriate challenge as well. Thank, thank you for that. And then, uh, where's, uh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, um, Astrid Stuckerberger, uh, Institute of Global Health, University of Geneva, but also part of a consortium on social determinants of health Research capacity building is a European Union research world, 12 countries from low and middle income countries. Anyway, the, uh, I have an issue since the beginning of today uh, about the um, coherence between research, policy, and reality. And I wonder if sometimes 
there are not some aspects that are really important uh, missing in the society reality check. And two of them I will mention here. One is the demographic that it has maybe not been mentioned in the way I would like to mention it. There are today four to five generations living together. Professor Ursula Lea from the Ministry of Health has mentioned this already 15 years ago, how this is going to reshape every policy in Europe, especially the, most, the oldest country, uh, the region in the world. So in that aspect, there is transgenerational inequity, transgenerational health, uh, poverty, and we know that from research that abuse, violence, etc., transmits from generation to generation. So if we don't break the vicious circle with a transgenerational uh, perspective, then we will miss it. It's like a bucket full of holes and we will never reach equity in society. The second one, it's been mentioned very slightly, is technology. And some have said, some philosophers have said that technology is like books is going to create a revolution in the world. It is already reshaping the world and everything we are doing from mobile health to bionics to, uh, you know, the more you age, I'm a specialist in aging, the more you age, the more you need technology. And technology is the solution. It was said before that it costs a lot, but this is wrong. Look at the data, look at Intel, uh, who has created the Moore's Law. Uh, technology is growing exponentially, but the price is decreasing exponentially. Mobile phones cost almost nothing today. So if we don't take into consideration those two to reshape, uh, be efficient, <laughs> uh, have efficacy and be sustainable, if we don't look at these generation gaps and create a digital homeless society, then I think we will miss the point of the future. That's a really great intervention. Uh, right, let's turn to the panel. Actually, just going to start with um, Barbara on the specific question about joint programme initiatives and their potential under the Horizon 2020 programme. Yes, under Horizon 2020, there are various possibilities of funding uh, in addition to the, let's say, common collaborative research. Now, whether it's on uh, joint programming or uh, an era net, uh, these are all uh, types of programmes that need to be built up and are built up at the basis uh, with the member state, with initiative from the member state. And uh, so it is uh, certainly an option to be explored, but there it is really uh, the Commission follows some clear direction uh, taken up by member states and adds to that. Very good. Who would like to take the question on um, research findings and the, t the timing gap in terms of uh, impacting policy? Noel, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah. Um, well, I think that in, in the case of the parenting interventions in, in particular, we do have a lot of knowledge and there is a lot of schemes already in place. There's a lot of things happening. Um, so, but we do need more research, um, and that's not just from a self-preservation point of view. We do need more research, um, but in particular, it's possibly more detailed research on what we already know and what Angela referenced there. Um, we need uh, longer follow-ups, um, and when we, have, when we have this knowledge about the uh, outcomes across the life course, I think that's going to make it um, much, much easier um, for policymakers, um, for advocates to sell it to policymakers um, across sectors, because if we start seeing positive outcomes across the life course, um, I think that, that, will, that will make a real difference. And the other thing I, I think to, to remember is that um, developing knowledge uh, and research, it, it's not a static process. Um, there's constant innovation, and a lot of the time we maybe do need to um, implement interventions and act um, where, in the case where it's, uh, something is evidence-informed rather than evidence-based, and from there we can generate more and more innovation and get that really sort of um, uh, uh, definitive answers um, to, to these uh, very important questions. And um, on the, uh, the question about um, economic research, um, thinking about your work on labour markets, would you just like to say a few words on that, Merrill, in terms of are we doing enough economic research? Do we have enough health economists engaged at a locality level in terms of really understanding uh, needs and interventions? 
Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, now we are um, more often in our uh, evaluation studies of uh, return to work programs. Uh, nowadays we uh, uh, pay more attention to the business case. We, we make also business cases to um, evaluate where, whether the um, return to work programs are also uh, cost effective. So uh, there's more uh, focus on uh, also the economic side. And uh, I want to uh, um, make a statement that a better health of the workforce will keep people active in the labor market and thus create productivity, competitiveness and economic prosperity. So taking care of the health of the workers will create uh, economic benefits. Thank you. And Barbara on the same question. Yes, uh, I, I wanted to add that under, let's say, the whole cost dimension uh, in terms of uh, when you link that to uh, health systems, health services, research, or population health uh, will be more, uh, let's say, um, explicitly asked for uh, under Horizon 2020. This uh, being said, I think there's also the need to, to develop maybe new measures, uh, new economic measures to better uh, assess the effect of an intervention, but also how it affects uh, the individual in society. And uh, the final question um, deserves to be broken into two, I think, although the two parts are connected. So, first of all, um, are, we, are, we, are we sort of falling behind in terms of both research and policy dis development in terms of this, you know, sort of looming reality of what um, a rapidly aging population and multiple uh, generations uh, actually means? Are we in danger of um, pursuing a research agenda which is already out of date? Um, Andrew, would you mind having first go at that? Okay. Um, it seems like it's quite a big question. Um, I mean, we certainly take a life course approach, um, recognising um, that there is transmission from generation to generation. So, for instance, if you start... Um, uh, making sure that school-aged children are given the right uh, information about what a normal relationship is and maybe they won't go into a relationship um, uh, with the wrong expectations of their partner that will then be transferred through to children and so forth. So I think that there, throughout the life course there are really good uh, points at which you can intervene. Um, I don't, I don't know if we are falling um, behind. I mean, moving on to, to the role of technology, uh, we were at um, a conference the other day uh, organised by a group called Natural England, um, thinking about how to get people out and about and utilising open space more. And they were all talking, you know, all talking about the use of apps for this and apps for that. And, um, and I think that there are quite a lot of... Uh, uh, innovative groups who are utilising that, uh, you know, uh, modern technology now. I will say, um, I was in conversation with somebody, it might just have been a pub conversation, but um, she was on a Horizon scanning, scanning group for the Cabinet Office in the UK, and they were looking at the role of technology and what that would mean for inequalities. Now, I understand that some people here have said, you know, well, mobile phones are, are coming down in price. But the general view of that group was that the use of technology, there was a big risk um, that it would increase health inequalities because, you know, uh, bionic uh, arms and nanotechnology, for instance, might become uh, just uh, for the rich. So I think it's, it's something to, to keep an eye on. Um, and I do think that some people are thinking about it, but maybe we need to do some more. Uh, well, it, it's part uh, of, of the type of research that is currently being funded. I think the importance is that uh, uh, about what works and what works uh, when we specifically targeting the elderly to promote uh, healthy aging and the quality of life. And then the equity mentioned should be addressed within that. Uh, so definitely we're conscious of that issue. But I think there are also quite diverging views on uh, the use of new technologies uh, within society as a whole and I think so within the research community. 
I think if I could just add to, to what's been said on technology, I, I think our mindset, both from a research and policy development perspective, has to be about the ability of technology to give more control to the individual and their carers where carers are, are involved. And I think if we have that mindset that technology is a means to an end and that it's about in the individual being empowered with more information and more control about their relationships with the rest of the, uh, the system that is supporting them, then it can be very enabling. Um, and, and I think we just need to, um, uh, as I say, adopt that, adopt that mindset.